So welcome everybody, uh, good day to you all, whatever part of the day you may be in and you're part of the world. Um, thanks so much for joining us. I myself, I'm in Canberra, so I'd like to start by acknowledging the first Australians on whose traditional land I stand today and uh, pay my respect to the elders of the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people, past, present and emerging. And I'd like to extend that um, respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander who may be joining us tonight. So thank you all for, for coming um, and many, many thanks to uh, Martin Ivar for giving us his time and insight. This is very much appreciated. Um, I don't think, uh, as Ben was saying yesterday, that you need much introduction in the mathematical world. I don't think you need much introduction outside of the mathematical world, I would say these days. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> And um, let me say that I, uh, I absolutely loved the talk yesterday. And this comes from someone who really doesn't like Zoom talks. So um, <laughs> you've, you've challenged my biases and showed me that doing a good Zoom talk is actually possible. So that was, uh, that was very enjoyable. And, um, and I have to say that for me, when you, when you show that parallel between the example of defining one upon mod X minus Dirac mass and uh, sort of Ito and Stratonovich integrals. I never made that link before. So it was a light bulb moment and I, I really uh, appreciated that. So thank you so much. And uh, I'm looking forward to more insights tonight. So we're getting a little bit more um, technical now and, and uh, we're going to have a survey of research directions on, on SPDs. We're all ears. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for coming back. Uh, yeah, so today, well, actually, it's not going to get very technical today at all, actually. It's going, it's going to get more technical next next week, well, in two weeks' time, I guess. Um, so I wanted to just, okay, so I, I didn't want to give kind of, you know, specific sort of technical open problems. Um, what I thought I'd do is I... I give you sort of more like a kind of view of the faraway mountains, right? So we, we are all sort of uh, trying to make our way to the bush and sort of, you know, you're sort of knocking down uh, bits and pieces of obstacles kind of one at a time. Uh, but sometimes it's good to kind of see, you know, what are the faraway high mountains up where in the distance that, you know, we might be aiming for. And we certainly don't expect to reach them um, very soon, but you know, hopefully at some point we're getting closer. Um, and so, so the the type of problems uh, that I want to sort of talk about today, they are sort of most of them uh, they are related to kind of the general theme in probability theory which is that uh, you want to, you know, you start from some sort of a probabilistic model that has some sort of, you know, uh, small scale description, and then you want to understand what it kind of looks like at larger scales. Okay, so that, that's the type of um, problems that, uh, that I'm going to talk about. And that, so just to make it absolutely clear, so I'm, I'm not saying that you know, these are the only interesting questions that there are in SPD theory. There are many other kind of interesting questions. Um, I'm not saying that they are, you know, better or whatever than others. Uh, so it's just a matter of personal taste and, you know, one has to make choices. And so that's the problems that I chose to talk about today. Um, so maybe the, um, the first sort of collection, if you want, of uh, conjectures or problems um, that I want to talk about. They're kind of more or less directly related to the last part of uh, yesterday's talk. So that was these sort of 1D uh, interface models. And so one question that you can ask yourself is, you know, like what's a, do you have something like a classification um, of possible scaling limits for these models? Um, 
And so here's, so, okay, so that sounds awfully way, vague as a question. So I want to turn this into a kind of precise mathematical question. Okay, so I want to turn it um, into a precise problem. And this is a problem, by the way, that one doesn't even have a conjectural answer to. Okay, so many of the other problems that I'm going to mention have conjectural answers. And in some cases, the conjectures are extremely well-founded. So there's sort of high certainty that the conjecture is correct. In some cases, it's sort of less well-founded. Uh, here, that one is an example where one doesn't even have a conjecture. Um, but, but still one can, you know, the question is interesting and one can ask the question. Um, and so how does we turn, how do we turn that into a math problem? So what's the kind of scaling limits that we're interested in, right? So here the scaling limits are sort of like yesterday. Um, <clears throat> so you have some um, stationary, say, okay, so you have a process H, um, so say on R plus times R to R. Um, and, you know, you should think of this R plus here as being time, and this R here as being space. Um, and so, so what's the kind of properties that you would want on this process? So this is going to be random. Um, so you would want it to be, to have somehow, to be stationary or at least to have stationary increments, um, stationary maybe, stationary increments. Um, you want some kind of invariance on the height shifts. Um, so what I mean is that, say height shifts. Um, what I mean is that if you, if you take, so for example, if you condition, say you condition on H zero, um, h at time zero, and then you look at h at some later time, you look at the probability distribution of that, also like the whole process conditioned on what it does at time zero. Um, and so you have some kind of regular conditional probabilities for that. And you want these to have the property that if I shift h zero upwards by a constant, then the conditional probability distribution just shifts upwards by the same constant. Okay, so that's what I mean by invariance on the height shifts. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so the, if you want to, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm not going to formalize it. You, I hope it's sort of clear what I meant. Right? Um, oh yeah, by the way, so if it, if it's not clear what I meant, uh, feel free to to interrupt any time. Okay, or or just I try to keep an eye on the chat. So sort of, you know, uh, I think. Ben, were you trying to say something? I think you were muted. No. Uh, okay. So then another property you would want, right? So you want this kind of invariance on the height shifts. Um, you want some sort of not necessarily Markov property, uh, but something that I would say local specifications. Um, and what I mean by local specifications is say, if I take a space time region, right, so I have space here, I have time, uh, and I take a space time region sort of like that. Um, and then say I condition my process on, you know, what happens here. So I take the sigma algebra that's kind of generated by evaluations at these points, right? Um, and then you look at what happens over there, right? So in this region, conditioned on what happens down there. And so you would want something along the lines that, well, you know, there's sort of like a little, maybe, maybe like a kind of boundary region here, which is sort of of order one, um, so that it really, right? So that somehow the guy here, the conditional distribution of what happens here, conditioned on all of that uh, actually really just depends on what happens here, right? So it's some sort of a, it's a bit like a Markov property, um, 
on the one hand, it's a bit weaker because I don't, I don't say that it depends only on what happens on the boundary here, but they allow for sort of, you know, like a little boundary layer. Uh, so it can have sort of like short memory. Um, but then on the other hand, it's a bit stronger because I don't, you know, I don't necessarily uh, force this to be a horizontal line, right? So the Markov property would be that property for sort of, you know, regions that are of this type with a horizontal line here. Okay. Um, so that's a very natural. So if you, you know, if you think of, you know, actual problem models of interface um, growth, like this ballistic deposition model that I showed yesterday, or well, there's this Tetris model that I sometimes show simulations of where you just have Tetris bricks that kind of fall down and they just pile up the way Tetris bricks pile up. If you take these type of models or you take the whatever totally asymmetric simple exclusion or any sort of model of interface growth, they actually satisfy these properties, right? Um, and so now the question then is, you know, you take a model like that, which has these properties, and then you want to take a limit of the form limit epsilon goes to zero of say epsilon to the alpha uh, h of um, t times epsilon to the minus beta and x epsilon inverse minus say c epsilon t Right, so you want such a limit to converge, to exist, right? So you want, does there exist a limit, say H bar, uh, or maybe maybe call it capital H, right? So does there exist a limit capital H? And then, you know, subsidiary question, uh, what sort of exponents alpha and beta uh, can show up, okay? So here the question would be, <clears throat> look, take all models of this type, uh, what are the possible exponents alpha and beta uh, that exist for which you can find such a model um, and so that such a limit exists and what kind of limits can you get? So what are, if you have a limit like that, right? So what are the properties of the possible limits? Um, so one property is of course scale invariance, right? So if you, you've obtained the limit by taking one fixed process and just rescaling, um, <clears throat> obviously if this process has a limit, then the limit itself has to be invariant under the process of rescaling, right? Um, so, so the possible limit necessarily has scale invariance. Um, then, well, invariance on the height shifts is still preserved, right? So you would still have invariance on the height shift. And now the that sort of local specification property that I tried to explain on the last slide now turns into the actual space-time Markov property. Right, so space-time Markov just means, well, exactly the same property as before, but that little tube now has become a line, right? So it's become sort of infinitely thin, and that's clear why you get that, because you rescale it, and when you rescale, that tube shrinks. Um, and of course, you know, here the fact that, yeah, I mean, you, you could allow things that actually depend, you know, not just on what happens in a little tube, but also what happens further out, as long as that dependence sort of decays sufficiently fast. Right? Um, and in the limit, you would get a space-time Markov property if that decays sufficiently fast. Um, and this, this is, oh yeah, I mean, it's still stationary, right? So it, we started off stationary, so, so you still end up stationary and well, possibly stationary increments only, right? Think of something like Brownian motion. Um, so now if there was no space, right? If there were no, if there was no space, then 
then we have a full classification, right? The classification of all the processes that have these properties, they are precisely the alpha stable Levy processes, right? Because, well, <clears throat> space time Markov now just means Markov. Uh, this invariant, well, stationary increments still means stationary increments. And then the invariance on the height shift, really, if you combine the invariance on the height shifts with the Markov property, that really just means now incre independent increments rather than just stationary increments. Okay, so that turns sort of stationary into independent, uh, well, independent plus stationary still. Uh, and then you want scale invariance. Okay, and the only, the only Markov process, the only processes with independent increments that are scale invariant are the alpha stable Levy processes. Okay, so in the, uh, in the, and, and here the scale invariance, <coughs> well, comes with the question of what are the possible exponents. Right? So here we have two exponents, right? So there's this alpha exponent and the beta exponent. We can always set one of them to one. So I just by convention set the one in front of x to one. Uh, it doesn't make any difference, right? I can replace epsilon by epsilon square, and then it sets that one to two and so on. Uh, so you can always set one of the exponents to one. There are two exponents left here, alpha and beta. If you only have time, there's only one exponent, which is alpha. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so for the, uh, yeah, okay. So <laughs> this alpha, of course, is really one over this alpha here. Okay, sorry for the, <laughs> for the inconsistency in notation. Um, <clears throat> so, so in the case of the uh, alpha stable Levy processes, well, so now we, you know, for this alpha here, we know what are the possible ranges, right? So we know that you can have alpha stable Levy processes for alpha between zero and two, uh, and two included, you get Brownian motion. Um, so we have a full classification and we know exactly which exponents can appear. You see, not, not every exponent can appear, right? So there is no um, <clears throat> process with sort of scaling exponent three that has all of these properties. Um, Can I just <clears throat> interrupt for a second? There's a question in the chat. If you... Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, can you allow? Can you allow sloped limit Markovian lines for relativistic invariance? Oh, uh, I don't know. Okay, no, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. I, yeah, I don't know. Um, here, I'm you know I'm thinking about stuff like forest fire, so they, they don't move at relativistic speeds. Um, so, okay, so, so here, this is one open question, right? So, but this is a sort of super wide open question. Um, <clears throat> we have examples of possible, of processes with these properties, right? So the, so examples, well, one example is actually the stochastic heat equation. Right? So the stochastic heat equation so just dTU equal to dx square u plus space-time white noise uh, that has all of these properties and in this case, uh, with these exponents, you would have uh, beta equal two and alpha equal to a half, right? So here there would be alpha equal a half, beta equal two. Yeah. Um, there's another example we have, <coughs> which is this KPZ fixed point. which I mentioned uh, yesterday, which was the scaling limit of these, uh, these models, the sort of asymmetric models of interface growth, the ones that are not reversible. Um, and that one would have alpha equal to a half and beta equal to, oh, with this, I think three half with this way of writing things. Okay. Um, and again, it has all of these properties. Um, there's actually, there's a third example, 
that we uh, we recently sort of discovered with one of my postdocs, which we call the Branian Castle. Um, it has a very explicit description. Um, I can, well, I don't think I have time to describe it, but it, it's a it's much more explicit than right. So the stochastic heat equation is very explicit. It's a Gaussian process. <clears throat> you can solve it, right? You have an explicit expression for the heat kernel. So you can just write it as a Gaussian process with a certain covariance. Uh, the KPZ fixed point has an explicit description, but it's extremely complicated. Um, so there are just you know certain observables for which you can find an expression for the expectations in terms of the Fredholm determinants or Fredholm determinants of you know complicated operators that you build for them, uh, and then you can show that there's enough such observables to characterize that uniquely. Uh, so it's a very indirect somehow description. <clears throat> this one is again a very direct description. So it's again sort of like a free object in the sense that um, it's built in a somewhat straightforward way out of Gaussian things. It's not itself a Gaussian process, but it's built out of Gaussian things. Um, <clears throat> and that one, the exponents are alpha equal one and beta equal two. Okay. Um, oh, actually, I can show you a simulation of that process. So, okay, so this is a simulation. So this one is it's discontinuous. So in some sense, it's it's a bit more like a Levy process than like a Brownian motion. Um, and so, if I freeze time, well, you see that. It's, so this is a discrete simulation. So this is a discrete uh, model. Um, so the model in question is actually very simple. What you do is you do the discrete model is the following. So you take a height function, uh, which really just goes from R plus times Z actually to Z. Yeah. Uh, and the way you update it is you have independent Poisson clocks at every site. Uh, and if the clock, uh, say at X rings, then uh, H of say T plus X is equal to, oh, maybe I should. Um, <clears throat> so if the clock rings, then the new value at X there are three possibilities. So it's either the old value at x minus one or the old value at x plus one or the old value of x, which have increased by one. Okay, and that's with probability a third, a third, a third. Okay, so probability a third, probability a third, probability a third. Okay, so whenever the clock rings, uh, you roll a three-sided die, uh, and depending on how it comes up, you either the new value at the location where it rings is either equal to the value on the right, so you replace it completely by the value on the right, or you replace it by the value on the left, or you increase by one. Uh, and when you do that, you get, so this is the process that you get. Um, well, with okay, a bit of fancy graphism, but you should think of the process being really this kind of top line that you see here, sort of the interface between the bricks at the bottom and the empty space at the top. Um, and what you see on that picture, right, is already, so here I've scaled out so that there's, I don't know, four or 5,000 bricks horizontally. Um, so you clearly see that there's this continuities uh, appearing. So, so this process actually has increments that look like Cauchy, um, random variables. So this is very explicit. You can explicitly uh, characterize the limit um, and it's not difficult to check that it has these uh, scaling exponents, right? So the alpha equal one is the same scale. That's the one stable Levy process is also the one that has Cauchy distributions as their increments, okay? So in some sense, 
at fixed time, this looks a bit like a one stable um, Levy process as a function of X. Um, but you can prove that it's not actually. Okay? It just sort of vaguely looks like it to the eye. Um, okay, so we have now three of these scaling limits. So there's KPZ, there's a stochastic heat equation, there's this Brownian castle. Um, and then the natural question is, you know, are there any others? There should be others, right? There's no reason that these three are the only ones, uh, but we don't know what the others are. And then we can ask ourselves, you know, if we, if here now I think of the board as being like a space of models, um, are there, and I think of this as being something, you know, I take this Wilsonian point of view where you think of it as being so dynamical system where the dynamic is the operation of zooming out uh, and these three guys, since they are scale invariants, they are fixed points under the operation of zooming out. Uh, and in this picture, there's somehow, if you want, the KPZ equation is some kind of heteroclinic clinic line that connects these two fixed points so in the sense that you can prove if you take a solution, if you take stationary solutions, a space time stationary solution to the KPZ equation, then it's not scale invariant. If you zoom in, you can prove that it converges to the stochastic heat equation. And if you zoom out, you can now prove that was the result recently proven by Jeremy Costell and Balint Virag. If you zoom out, it converges to this KPZ fixed point. Okay, so under the operation of zooming, here the KPZ equation corresponds to a line, one for each scale. Uh, and if you zoom backwards, it converges to this fixed point. If you zoom forward, it converges to this one. Right? So now here, there's a precise conjecture, which is that the KPZ equation is the only continuous process uh, that has this property. Um, at least maybe, yeah, I mean, you, you probably want to, um, to add stationarity as, I mean, sort of like in the, in the kind of processes that we're looking at here. Okay, so you certainly want some stationarity um, um, and maybe also some kind of space-time Markov property or something. But in, at least in that class of processes and probably in a wider class, there's a conjecture that the solution to the KPZ equation is the only process which has this property. Okay, and so we have, you know, we have sort of partial results that go very strongly in the direction, right? So even the results that I showed you yesterday, yes, uh, is there a reason why the scaling under consideration has to be of power type? Uh, not a priori. Actually, my next example is going to be one where the scaling is not of power type. Yeah, but, um, but in most, I would say in most cases, the natural scalings would be of power type. Uh, I mean, you could imagine log corrections in some cases, but here in these one dimensional interface models, one doesn't really expect log corrections to show up. Um, okay, so here, and then here a question is, you know, what about other heteroclinic orbits here? Uh, so the interesting thing is that we seem, so this is something we think we can prove, um, which is that here there's a whole, there's more than one, right? So actually there are infinitely many such heteroclinic orbits that connect this Brownian castle to the stochastic heat equation. Uh, here we have no idea, okay? Numerically, if you do, you can do experiments, well, you see that there appears to be such an object, um, but we have no idea if it's unique in some sense or, you know, anything like that. Uh, so here, this is, <clears throat> this is completely open. Uh, this we believe that we have some kind of a proof that says that there's more than one. Uh, and here it's strongly suspected that there is only one. And so there's a conjecture that there really is only one. Um, okay, so that's somehow one of the, you know, that's sort of a collection of open questions that go in this direction here. Um, so 
now let me oh yeah so are there are there any other questions by the way okay so so still in one plus one dimensions isn't well especially since there was the question about scaling the power type um one can actually ask the following so if i look at the allen kahn equation stochastic allen kahn equation so that would be dtu still in one plus one dimension uh, dx square u plus um, u minus u cube and then i put a small parameter in front of the noise okay and this is space time white noise um, it doesn't really matter whether it's white in space or not here we're in one dimension uh, and the equation there's no, no no derivatives in the non-linearity so it's perfectly well posed with space-time white noise one doesn't need any fancy theory um, but the fact that it's white in space is not even relevant for the um, for the statement it's just somehow the natural thing to do okay and so now what do solutions to this equation look like so if you right, so if you look at it as a function of x so a typical solution is essentially going to sort of oscillate around that there's one and minus one which are the zeros of the right hand side here um, and so a typical solution is going to look like this it sort of oscillates around here and then at some point it goes down here and then it goes up here so that's sort of what a typical solution looks like. And there's kind of an old result by Bertini uh, that shows that if you look at the position of these fronts here, they essentially, right, so they kind of move around um, and they just perform Brownian motions. Right? Uh, on a scale, well, so it's Brownian motion, I guess, with variance epsilon here, because I put an epsilon in front of the noise. Okay. Um, so, and then, and if, so they perform essentially independent Brownian motions. Um, and it's not too difficult to convince oneself that if these guys meet, they annihilate. Okay. Um, and that means that if you put yourself into some sort of reasonably large region, so if you put yourself into a region here, which is of size epsilon to the minus alpha for any alpha, what you're eventually going to see is that basically all of these interfaces have annihilated, say if you put periodic boundary conditions, all of them have annihilated uh, and you end up with either the thing just basically being around one or it just being basically around minus one and with small oscillations. Okay. And so that's not super interesting. Um, although I'm not sure there's actually a theorem. Right, so you, you can guess how long it would take, right? Because it would be basically as long as it takes for a Brownian motion of variance epsilon to move by epsilon to the minus alpha. Okay, so you can sort of figure out how long that is. Um, I don't think that there's actually a theorem that proves that so that might be an interesting theorem but then the even more interesting question is well how far do you have to zoom out before you start to really see something interesting right so at scale epsilon to the minus alpha for any alpha you don't really see anything super interesting so you have to go to exponential scales um, right so you have to go to scales basically e to the constant over epsilon and one can figure out what the value for this constant is because there's actually an explicit expression for the invariant measure for that guy. So if you look at the invariant measure, so you freeze time, so you just look at the invariant measure as a process in space, then that process is actually a Markov process in space and it's just a diffusion. Uh, and one can figure out the potential. So it's a gradient diffusion, it's so a nice reversible diffusion. Um, there's a sort of implicit there's a formula for the potential. It's not explicit, but you can kind of figure it out in terms of you know lowest eigenfunction for some Schrodinger operator associated to this to this potential here. Um, so 
you know, and it has additive noise and the noise also has kind of variance epsilon, okay? And so this process here is basically just a diffusion in a kind of double well potential. So you have somehow a double well potential and you have a diffusion. And so then you know that if you have a diffusion with small noise in a double well potential, it's going to actually stay for exponentially long time down in the wells. Um, and, you know, Friday and Wenzel have computed the exponent here uh, for how long you have to wait before you actually see a transition from well, one well to the other, okay? And so that suggests that if you rescale this in just the right way, um, and of course, maybe there's some, you know, you might have to put some power law correction. Uh, so if you put the correct power law correction here, um, and here the friedlin Benzel sort of exponent, then you would expect to see something non-trivial for the invariant measure, right? So then the scale is sufficiently large so that in the invariant measure, you would, it would actually look like my picture, okay? So you would see a finite number of such transitions. Um, and then you can ask yourself, what about the dynamic, right? Sort of this limit. So here, So what's the limiting dynamic, right? So now the scale is sufficiently large. So of course you would have to rescale time basically diffusively up to a factor epsilon uh, so that you see these things move. Um, but now the scales are sufficiently large so that you would actually see like, you know, new pairs of fronts nucleating, right? So you would actually on these time scales, these exponential time scales, you would expect to actually see events of this type. Um, and the reason why you would see this, you know, because actually on these scales, this picture is a bad picture. What it looks like is really much more like this. Um, it really looks much more like Right, so in the sense that for every, you know, even if you put a small delta here, there is a, you know, there's going to be kind of a, in the limit, there's going to be like a dense set of points in which the solution actually almost gets to zero, you know, up to a delta, but it just doesn't quite cross it. And then you have these crossing points. And of course here you can kind of imagine that occasionally some of these things would cross and then you would have something like that forming. Uh, and then, you know, most of the time it would immediately disappear, but occasionally it would actually break up uh, and it would create one of these pairs of sort of kink, anti-kink. Um, and so there's a conjecture here. So there's a, uh, <clears throat> because the, there's a paper by Fontes, Isopi Newman and Ravi Shankar, where they actually constructed the scaling limit. Um, so it's called the continuum noisy auto model. There's an explicit construction. Um, so one has the limit, if you want, but the limit is just constructed as it is. Not, you know, in the paper they mentioned that PD, I think, as a motivation, but there's absolutely no proof that it links to the PD. Um, so that would be a super interesting, actually, kind of result to be able to prove something like this. So one has a conjectured limit, one sort of knows what the scaling should be, so it's actually a very precise uh, type of conjecture. Maybe it's not completely clear what the exponent here is. Um, and well, so the question is, does this you know, limit actually take place? And so this is an example where you have something like a scaling limit. Uh, but with scalings that are exponentials and not power laws. Um, so, so this was all 1D. Um, if you take, well, if you take this Alan Kahn, um, there's a 2D version of it, right? So you can look at 
dtu equal Laplacian u plus constant u minus u cube plus space time white noise and now x take values in R2. Uh, so this process exists. Um, it's more involved to define because the solution to that guy is just about not, yeah, okay, huh. <laughs> yes, so there are conjectures in 2D. Um, so this is now 2D. So, so this guy, it needs some randomization, right? So it, it exists as a process, but it has to be constructed in a way like I, I sort of explained at the end of the lecture yesterday where you sort of mollify the noise and you have to take that constant. Um, and actually that, that constant has to go like log epsilon um, plus say C tilde. Um, and the prefactor here is known. I just, just don't remember what it is. Um, and so this actually has a limit and the limit is kind of completely well defined. So there is a, it's clear what the process is. Um, and then you can, and one also knows what the invariant measure is. Well, at least if I replace R2 by the torus, right? And so it, it's formally, it's a gradient system, right? So you can kind of uh, guess what the invariant measure is. And in some sense, well, it is, just e to the minus integral, uh, well, I guess with a quarter or something, integral of u to the four dx um, times, well, so plus say constant integral of u squared dx and then times the uh, Gaussian free field du. All right, so if you, if you didn't have the nonlinearity to so take just stochastic heat equation, uh, then that one, the invariant measure is a free field, uh, which is just the Gaussian field that has the uh, Green's function of the Laplacian as its covariance. Um, and then here you have this additional term, which is a gradient of this potential. And therefore the invariant measure is given by this expression here. Um, maybe if there's a square root of two here. Um, and okay, so there's a slight problem, which is that the Gaussian free field lives on distribution. So it's not completely clear what this U4 and this U square mean, uh, but you can take them in terms of wick powers and the wick powers are perfectly well defined. And so the invariant measure, so here this expression is actually a genuine, right? So this is a genuine rather Nikodin derivative. Okay, in two dimensions, the invariant measure has a rather Nikodin derivative with respect to the free field uh, and the derivative is given by this expression, provided that you interpret these powers as weak powers, okay? So at least on finite volume, okay? So we have an invariant measure, we have a nice process. Um, and then, well, so the first, so I would say, it's, okay, so I'm not completely sure if I should call it a conjecture or a fact, I think it was essentially proven back in the eighties. Uh, so I could call it a fact, um, is that there is a phase transition. What I mean, right, similar to easing. So in the sense that depending on the value of C here, so that's phase transition in C. Depending on the value of C, uh, this kind of measures either have a unique limit as you go to infinite volume, or they actually are non-unique. And you basically, you have two different limits. Um, one of them that sort of, in some sense, sits on the positive views and one that sits mostly on the negative views. Okay, and so there's a critical value of C. Say C naught. Um, and so now one conjecture here is that, so now again, this equation is not scale invariant, right? So it's sort of like KPZ. If I rescale this equation, the stochastic heat equation is scale invariant. And if I rescale the equation, for example, in such a way that the stochastic heat equation stays the same, there's only one way of doing it. 
um, and one can just see that these two terms actually don't stay the same. Okay, so it's just not scale invariant. Um, so the conjecture is that if you put yourself at the critical value c naught, so let me let me give it a name here. So mu c is equal to this, uh, and then I rescale. Right, so I I take um, yeah okay. How should I formulate this? So maybe I have a scale. Right, so I have a um, yeah okay. So I have a scaling map S epsilon. So S epsilon U, um, say of X is equal to, and here the correct exponent is minus one over eight actually, U of X over epsilon, okay. Um, and then what you expect is that if I push forward mu c under s epsilon. In other words, if I, and that's the mu c naught, that's the critical one. So in other words, I look at the invariant measure of this guy and then I rescale it to large scales. And I rescale it in this way with this exponent one eight. Then this converges to some limit, right? so, so mu star as epsilon, uh, goes to zero and the mu star is the same as scaling limit for the magnetization field in 2D easing, critical also. Okay, and so this is something which is known to exist. So there is a paper by um, Garbon and Newman um, and Camilla, so there are three authors. Uh, so it's actually a series of two papers, but they showed that this scaling limit exists. So this is an object which in some sense is known to be well-defined. Um, and the conjecture here is that you get the same object if you take a scaling limits of that. Um, I think this is extremely well founded as a conjecture. Okay, so there, I don't think there's any doubt at all that this is true. Um, but, but it still would be something very nice to prove. Now, the thing which is much more open, well, I mean, this is obviously open, it's a very hard problem. Um, the problem where one doesn't even have a conjecture is what happens if I now take the solution to the SPD and I rescale it in the same way. So now I, because now, now I have to choose an exponent of how to rescale time. And this is called the dynamical scaling exponent. So that will be sort of the analog of the beta, right? So in this case, this is the alpha. So alpha is minus one over eight in this case. Um, one over eight, I think was the way I wrote things. Uh, so alpha is one over eight and the correct beta for which the solution to the SPD would actually have a scaling limit is completely unknown. So that's called the dynamical scaling exponent for easing. You can kind of look it up on Wikipedia for easing. There are numerics. And so there's a numerical value to four digits somewhere. Uh, it doesn't look like a rational number. Okay, so, so here, this is completely open how you would have to rescale the SPD so that there is a limiting dynamic. Um, one thing which is potentially much easier to show is what happens in d greater equal to four. Okay, so again, I take again the same equation. Right? So I still take dtu for plus and u plus u minus u cube, say. Um, and here now I take, let me write eta for it. Uh, so I take a noise, which is say white in time and colored in space. Okay, so here space time white noise, it really doesn't make sense. Uh, in dimension four, the solutions are way too singular. And so here you just make it white in time and colored in space. Okay, so, so there's no problem in defining solutions. Um, and, and you take X, oops, 
So here the spatial variables X takes values in RD and D is greater or equal to four. Um, and the conjecture in uh, D equal four, D greater or equal to four is that essentially, so now you try to take scaling limits. Okay. Um, and the conjecture is that, well, if you choose again, so if C is chosen correctly, that's basically the critical C, then there is a scaling limit, but the scaling limit is actually just the stochastic heat equation. Okay. So, so the conjecture here is that if you take this, you rescale it, then of course your colored noise becomes white noise right, by the time you look at it at large scales. Uh, so this turns into white noise, but the nonlinearity essentially disappears. Um, that's not to say, right, so if you rescale it in the way so that formally the noise stays the same, I mean that part stays the same, and this disappears, that would suggest that in the limit the coefficients in front of here are just one and one again. Uh, that's not necessarily the case, so these coefficients might actually change, um, but and, and the limit is not necessarily sort of a limit in probability, so it's just a limit in law. Um, but the scaling limit is still conjectured to just be the stochastic heat equation. Okay, so the, so the conjecture is in dimension greater or equal to four. You can't get anything else than just stochastic heat equation if you're looking at kind of scaling limits of things of that type. Um, at the level of the invariant measures, Uh, for D equal four, which is the hardest case, this was very recently proven by Duminil Copin and Eisenman. So they showed that if you take, uh, if you want a measure of this type in four dimension, you take some discrete version of a measure of this type, for example, uh, so they looked at things on the lattice. So you take a measure like that on the lattice um, and then you try to rescale it and they showed that whichever way you choose the parameters, whichever way you do the rescaling, the only possible limits that you can get are Gaussians. Uh, they don't prove that you actually get a free field in the limit, so that's still conjectured, uh, but they prove that you always get Gaussians. Okay, so that's it. So partially this is proven. In higher dimensions, this was proven earlier by Eisenmann and by uh, Jörg Freulich, but that, that goes back to the 80s. That's sort of an old result. But again, this is for fixed time, right? So this is just at the level of the invariant measure. Conjecture is that this holds for the dynamics. Uh, I think this is, a, again, kind of a well-founded conjecture. Um, and Okay, so I think I'm sort of getting towards the end. So maybe, okay, so there, there's a whole bunch of conjectures one can make for young mills also, but uh, I think they are more difficult to state. Um, and anyway, I think they, they are, they are kind of so far out there in terms of what one can even believe that one can do um, that it's, yeah, I'm not sure that's, too much of a point. So maybe maybe I kind of finish on something which is sort of more more realistic, um, which is the oh how about dimension three? Yes, in dimension three, dimension three is one of these cases where also one one well so it's it's more open than on the than the other dimension right. So dimension three is more open in the sense that one doesn't even have good conjectures. Um, right, so in dimension two, for example, the conjecture is quite precise in the sense that I can tell you what this exponent is. Right? Um, in dimension three, we, you would expect something similar, uh, but I can't even tell you what the exponent is. So even, even the fact that there exists such an exponent in dimension three is an open problem 
even for discrete versions of this model. Uh, of course, it's believed to be true, and one has good numerics for that exponent. And there are sort of there are semi heuristic arguments that allow you to compute that exponent very precisely in dimension three. So actually, nowadays, I think if you look it up on Wikipedia, you have this exponent to like six digits or something in dimension three, uh, but it's numerics. Uh, but it's a sort of super smart numerics. It's not numerics that goes about actually simulating the equation and trying to extract the scaling behavior because that would never give you six digits for an exponent. Um, it's numerics based on heuristics, based on this operator product expansion that people do in uh, sort of theoretical physics. Uh, and it's basically a heuristics about a heuristics, uh, but it works extremely well, actually. Sort of that heuristics about a heuristic allows you to actually come up with kind of a boxing in scheme uh, that allows you to, in some sense, localize where the scaling exponents should be in the space of scaling exponents, if you want. Um, and it allows you to do that very efficiently. So you can compute these exponents to four, five or six digits in dimension three, but one doesn't even have an analytic expression for them. <clears throat> um, yeah, so for these, so, you know, so these five formal, I mean, they are vaguely related to self-avoiding random walks as well, right? And so somehow this scaling exponent one over eight is sort of vaguely related to the three quarter scaling exponent in the uh, uh, 2D scale, conjectured scaling limit of the uh, self-avoiding random walk. And again, it's one of these things where in 4D and higher, you know that the self-avoiding random walk converges to a brand new motion. Uh, and in 3D, one doesn't have any clue. One doesn't even know what the exponents are. So that's sort of for the same reason. Um, okay, so, so here's something which is sort of maybe a bit closer, so <laughs> slightly more down to earth, uh, is about actually global solutions. Um, so global solutions in infinite energy situations. Um, and what I mean by this is, well, you know, you have these, so we have now these theories that give meaning to these very singular SPDs. Um, they are local solution theories, right? So the theory always tells you, oh, well, you know, you regularize things in a certain way, uh, you remove the regularization, you do this randomization business, then there exists a limit, but the limit exists sort of up to an explosion time. Okay, so potentially solutions could explode. Um, now, in some cases, for example, these five four, um, one can actually prove that solutions are global and even global in space as well, not just in time. Um, but that relies, so that's recent results by, uh, well, it was first by Jean-Christophe Moura and Hendrik Weber, and then by uh, Augustin Moinat and Hendrik Weber. And what, that relies very strongly on somehow this minus u cube giving you a very strong dissipation, right? So it sort of relies on the fact that the highest order term in your nonlinearity points inside in a sort of very strong way, right? Um, now, there are lots of equations that show up in mathematical physics where the highest order term is actually kind of energy preserving. So there's some kind of energy and the highest order term in the nonlinearity preserves the energy, right? So think of Navier-Stokes. Uh, so that's the easiest example or the most, maybe no, maybe not the easiest, but it's the, the best known example, right? So if I take Navier-Stokes, <coughs> it looks like dTu, uh, now u is a vector, right? It's Laplace and u um, minus u grad u and, you know, the ray projection. Um, and then I have, I put some noise. So I take stochastic Navier-Stokes. So here the nonlinearity is quadratic, uh, but this bit preserves the L2 norm, right? So if I look at, at least formally, um, the derivative of the L2 norm square, so of a half is just, you know, minus gradient u square, which comes from the Laplacian. 
Um, and then, well, okay, and then there's stuff that comes from Xi. So as actually there's like an Eto term, which is a constant in this case. Um, and then you would have a Martingale term. Um, so here the highest order term just doesn't contribute here, right? So the energy here is preserved uh, by the highest order term. And so now you can ask yourself, well, what if you're in a situation where the covariance of the noise is sufficiently bad so that that constant here becomes infinite, right? So that constant uh, is something like the trace of uh, what you end up with. So here you essentially end up with the trace of the covariance operator of that noise or something like that, right? So you have a, <coughs> um, if your noise is sufficiently badly behaved, then, then this formula doesn't make sense anymore, right? Uh, so the solution just doesn't end, isn't in L2 anymore, okay? And so now the question is what, what if you are in this situation where the solution is not in L2, you have this kind of, for the deterministic equation, you have somehow L2 energy estimates that rely on having some cancellation in the nonlinearity. Um, can you carry that over to the similar case, right? So does, now, does this guy have global solutions? Um, global solution when U is not in L2, okay? And there are cases, so there's at least, there's one case where we know the answer. So this is in dimension two for Navier-Stokes, right? Because otherwise you don't even have uniqueness of solutions or you don't know it. Um, so if you take the, if you make the noise white, uh, I think you want to, make, yeah. So if you, if you take, if you take white noise, if you take space-time white noise uh, in two dimensions, then formally you actually know what the invariant measure is because the invariant measure formally should be a free field, should be somehow. Uh, right? So if psi is space-time white noise in dimension two, then formally invariant measure uh, is a free field. And that comes from the fact that the free field formally is given by e to the minus a half integral gradient u square du, where this would be like Lebesgue measure, okay? But it's in the sense that of course you have a quadratic expression and then you interpret this as being the inverse of the covariance operator. Um, and the reason why this is formally an invariant measure is because the H1 norm of u is also preserved by the nonlinearity in dimension two. Okay, so that's this special case of dimension two, which preserves both the L2 norm and the H1 norm. That's not true in dimension three. Okay. Uh, so in dimension two, formally the free field is invariant if you put white noise here. And well, there's a paper by the Prato and de Bush from 20 years ago where they actually proved that. So they constructed this process for white noise and they show that you know this is indeed the invariant measure for the process that they constructed. And so in particular then, once you have an invariant measure, you can essentially turn local solutions into global solutions. Okay, you can kind of imagine how that works. You need a little bit of a priori bounds on uh, tail bounds of the, on the measure, but this is a Gaussian measure, so it has very good tail bounds. Um, okay, so in this particular case, one knows that there is an invariant measure and therefore one knows that there are global solutions. Um, and so now the question is, you know, if you make the noise, anything, if you take, space-time white noise, but you just change the amplitude of one of the Fourier modes, right? So you write it in Fourier space, then it just becomes IID noises on every Fourier mode. You just change the amplitude of one of them. Okay? Then that breaks the fact that you know what the invariant measure is. Okay? And then one doesn't even know that there are global solutions anymore. Okay? Um, so I think this is sort of in this singular SPD case, the, the, I think that's kind of an important question is to have, find a technique uh, that allows to give global, global solutions for equations of that type, where sort of the highest order nonlinearity is not, the highest order of the nonlinearity is not quite dissipative, but it's sort of energy preserving. 
uh, but the solutions have infinite energy. So, <clears throat> okay, so, oh, oh yeah, so, okay, so I'm already over time. Uh, so, well, so this is as good a place to stop as any other. Um, so, well, thanks a lot again for your attention and then um, well, see you in two weeks. If there are any questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was uh, mind boggling in some ways for myself. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, any question before people go to bed or to teaching or to what they have to do next? Uh, uh, yes, there is one in the chat. Steve. Can you see it? Matt? Yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you maybe just say what Does something mean? about making this work rely on rotational invariants? Uh, but do you want to, Jeffrey, do you want to elaborate on that? Feel free to turn your mic on. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks a lot. It was really great. Hi. The um, change in one Fourier mode breaks rotational invariance of the white noise, of the noise. Oh, I see. For that, okay. In, that's what, oh, that's what you meant. Okay. Um, I don't think, I'm not sure that, that, so certainly the argument there doesn't rely on rotational invariance. It just relies on having an explicit form for the invariant measure, right? So they just have a candidate invariant measure. Uh, and they prove that the process they construct has that measure basically by choosing an approximation for which they know the invariant measure, right? So they choose a sequence of approximations so that for each guy in the sequence of approximation, you have an explicit formula for the invariant measure. And that one is an approximation to that measure. And then you sort of, you know, you take a limit at the level of the stationary processes. Um, and so, so you show that the limiting guy has that invariant measure as well. And then it really just relies on that, right? So once you, there's a kind of general argument uh, that just tells you that, you know, if you have local solutions and you have a bit of control on how fast they can blow up, then, you know, you relate that control to some control on the tails of the invariant measure. And if, you know, they kind of work out in the right way, then you get global solutions. It's sort of a quite simple argument. Um, so I think interestingly, that argument was to the best of my knowledge was actually first used by Bourguin in the nineties in a non stochastic situation, where in the case where, so he was looking at the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, uh, which formally has also an invariant measure, which is actually the same measure as this measure here, right? So if you, this measure here is formally invariant for the deterministic nonlinear Schrodinger equation, um, and Bourguin back in the 90s actually constructed run solutions to the nonlinear Schrodinger equation with initial condition drawn from this measure. And he showed that they then, this measure is then indeed invariant for those solutions. Uh, and part of, in part of his paper, he had to actually show that the solutions are global and he was using exactly that kind of argument. Uh, and interestingly, it seems that that argument was sort of later rediscovered in the SPD literature without sort of knowledge that Bourguin had also discovered the argument a few years earlier. Oh, I'm not sure, maybe there was no, okay. I'm, I, I wouldn't put my hand into the fire whether there was not, no, no knowledge or not. Yeah, I'm not sure say that. May I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, uh, still about Allen Kahn equation, you can consider say even one, dimension, uh, one dimensional space variable but you can have a system of Allen Kahn equations to have additional parameter in front of nonlinearity, and then you get a sort of approximation to some geometric flows, yes, to curvature flows or to heat flow for harmonic maps. Yeah. Are there any? Oh, uh, yes. Well, yes. So you get okay. So the 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 link to mean curvature flow. Uh, it's not so much about additional parameter. You actually take Allen Kahn in higher dimensions. So if you take Allen Kahn in two dimensions, right? So if I take uh, if I take Allen Kahn in two D, um, with now not space-time white noise, but just nice colored noise, uh, and I look at it at large scales, actually the solutions kind of look like this. So you see sort of patches like that, where essentially the solution is sort of one, alternates between regions where the solution is essentially one, regions where the solution is essentially minus one, uh, and there's some, you know, 
kind of boundary layer here in between. And this moves and the motion of these regions is a uh, mean curvature flow. Um, and here actually, the, so there's a, okay, so there's a super interesting open problem here, um, which is in some sense that, okay, it's, it's not so much of an SPD problem, well, it's kind of an SPD problem, but it's not, the, the PD is just a deterministic Allen Kahn. So even if you take deterministic Allen Kahn, okay, not stochastic at all. Um, so therefore deterministic Allen Kahn, here the motion is mean curvature. So if you take stochastic Allen Kahn, it would be some kind of random perturbation of mean curvature. And it's actually kind of, it's very interesting to try to understand that uh, better. So there are kind of, there are some papers, but it's not very conclusive. Um, but even simpler case, so if you take deterministic Allen Kahn, okay, so you have a, so then you really have these plus minus one regions and you have mean curvature flow for that. And now what you do is you start off with an initial condition, which is essentially white noise in space. Right? So you take initial condition, initial condition, which is uh, white noise in space. Um, and then you ask yourself, what does this look like? So now what happens is, so you can actually kind of make sense of that. So it's a little bit tricky because white noise in space is not sufficiently well behaved to actually be a decent initial condition for 2D Allen Kahn. Uh, but you can kind of fiddle around with it a bit and you can, you can construct a process which you can more or less convince yourself is the canonical one. Um, and, and then what you see, right? So then what you see is you have these random regions now. So these regions are random. They're kind of determined by your initial condition. Okay, so, so you have these random regions. And, and so now one can kind of, um, one can ask yourself, well, so first question is, what's the exponent here, right? So, so if you now look at large time, so you take 2D Allen Kahn with essentially white noise initial condition, but it doesn't even need white noise, right? So it could be just any random initial condition with short range correlation, right? So with just order one correlations. So it's basically white on scales larger than order one. Okay, so, so there's no problem of well positiveness. Uh, and then you look at the solutions after large time, right? Because so after a large time, these regions are quite large. Uh, and if I just put all the parameters one and Alan Kahn, then here the size of these interfaces is about one. Right? So this is about one, uh, but this alpha exponent is positive. Right? So alpha is positive. Um, and so the exponent alpha, one can somehow figure out that it should be, okay, I'm not 100% sure, I think it should be a half or something. Um, I think it's a half. One can sort of guess what the exponent is. Basically, you look at formally what would be the scaling exponent, which makes mean curvature flow in time. Right? So, so you can sort of guess what the exponent should be. Um, and so what you would expect is that there is some kind of stationary uh, random field, but now it's a ran or random set, right? So it's a random set of the plane with smooth boundaries, which is sort of that, set, say, the set of regions where it's one. Uh, Oh, yeah, this was plus one. Um, so you have this random set, which is invariant under mean curvature flow in the sense that if I take my random set, I flow forward by time one under mean curvature, and then I rescale it by the correct factor, uh, then you get the same random set back in law. Okay, you should, you should actually get a random set like this. Um, and it should be in some sense unique in the sense that um, if I start from basically any stationary random field with, you know, fast enough decay of correlation, uh, you should get, in law at least, you should get the same random set uh, as t goes to infinity. Um, and this, this is something that, so actually a characterization of this random set or even like the correlation function of this thing, even two point correlations or something. Um, 
that's that's something which would be very interesting. I mean, even like physicists don't know the answer, right? and they would like to know the answer. So, the, so this is one of these questions that are not that's not even a conjecture, right? So it's like completely open, in the sense that not even, so most of the other stuff that I talked about, they are conjectures in the sense that physicists consider them as theorems, or sort of consider them as settled question, um, but but there's no way you know we're nowhere near of having mathematical proofs for them. Uh, here, this is something where, you know, actually characterizing that set uh, is something where even physicists have no idea of what the correct answer is. Okay, so there are kind of, there are proposals, but the proposals are based on heuristics and they're, you know, well, for starters, there's more than one. And so there is no consensus of what the correct one is. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, yeah, thanks again. Um, I think we are going to close the proceedings for today. Uh, let me just quickly advertise. So we have quite a bit of activities next week also with Australians giving some talks and, uh, and hopefully some get together in various places to discuss the content. So uh, I'll send an email around this weekend with all the practical details. And uh, we'll see Martin again in two weeks for the mini course. And we'll have also the discussion session at the end of the whole symposium. So if you have some uh, more questions, build up your questions, build up your uh, knowledge, and um, let's bring that to that final discussion. So thanks again uh, very much for the talk tonight. Yeah, we'll see you in two weeks. <laughs>